philosophy is an odd thing. Um, when we use the word in everyday speech, you, you sometimes hear it hilariously. They say, oh, uh, oh it, it's never good to be late. That's my philosophy. <laughs> you think that's a, that's a generous, generous ascription of that rather dull precept to call it a philosophy. But, but it's odd how philosophers, generally speaking, at least the ones I've read or the ones I um, you know, value, don't have, in that sense, a philosophy. There is no particular Socratic or Nietzschean or Kantian way to live your life. They don't offer ethical codes and standards by which to live your life. They don't offer a philosophy to follow. They just simply raise an enormous number of questions, mostly. So in, that, in the sense that you, you put the question, is there a philosopher that's important to me? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I loved really the sort of Bertrand Russell grand sort of tour of, of philosophy, the history of, of philosophy from the pre-Socratics, pre as they're called, um, Zeno and so on, uh, uh, through to Socrates and Plato and, and Aristotle. I, I never quite liked Aristotle. But, um, I think that's partly, although he was obviously a genius and a brilliant, and he invented logic, so what's not to like? Um, I think it was his influence on the, on, the, on, the, on the medieval mind was probably rather pernicious and unfortunate and all those categories and things. But when it opened up, with I suppose Spinoza and then but then Kant really in the in the, the, the the Enlightenment era. Oh and actually Locke, I did like Locke. Um uh he was a fine philosopher. But they don't I mean what's so great about them is that they just you know, they're quite scary when you think of the word philosopher, and especially if it's logic and symbolic logic and you get onto Hegelian philosophy, it's incredibly difficult to read I find and, and you follow for about Oh, it's like trying to grab a salmon, you know? You, the harder you clutch at it, the, the more it springs, slips out of your hand, and whoa, it's gone, and you chase it again, and oh, what was that? And you feel very stupid. But the, um, I think the beauty of, of questioning and simplicity that you get from Kant in particular, I think, is just amazing, because it's, it's, like, um, it's like they say of simple mathematical laws you know, that make fractals, the, the tiniest little elegant observation about or question about something just spins out these immensely complex things that make you rethink everything. So, yes, I, I think philosophy is a really important um, dimension, but I think in our age we tend to be rather sloppy about it. We either we either think Buddhism is philosophy, which you know, or some sort of Eastern thing about being nice and spiritual and that, that'll do, which is fine. I mean, you know, obviously I believe in kindness and niceness and lots of spiritual things, but the real intellectual rigor and quest of logic is something that I'm afraid takes incredibly hard work. And we live in an age in which hard work is, if not actively deprecated or denigrated, it is um, run away from or ignored. It's sort of people frown at you and say, well, that's a bit dull and stupid. Why can't we just short circuit it and talk about, like, spirit? And, well, yeah, you can say spirit. But if you think that's philosophy and if you think that's, that's good enough. The most important philosophy, I think, is that even if it isn't true, you must absolutely assume there is no afterlife. You cannot for one second... I think, abrogate the responsibility of, of, of believing that this is it. Because if you think you're going to have an eternity in which you can talk to Mozart and, and, and Schopenhauer in, in, on a cloud and learn stuff and you know, really get to grips with knowledge and understanding, and so you won't bother now, I think you're, it's a terrible, a terrible mistake. It may be that there is an afterlife and I'll look incredibly stupid, but at least I would have had a crammed pre-afterlife, a crammed life. So to me, the most important thing is, um, you know, uh, as Kipling put it, you know, to fill every 60 seconds w um, with, you know, what is it? To fill every unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, you know, absolutely. Uh, so that's all I'm saying, I suppose, is that, um, is that it, there's no point wasting time um, being lazy. Though, of course, indolence in a divine way, axidy, has its, um, has its advantages. Oh, shut up, Steve. Okay, next one. It's interesting. Um, atheism uh, 
comes in for rather a bad press, and I suppose I'd rather describe myself as a humanist. I, a human, I don't believe in God. I don't believe there is a God. If I were to believe in a God, I would believe in gods. I think monotheism is the really ghastly thing. That is the absolutely staggering to me misapprehension. I can perfectly see why anybody might imagine that each thing, each thing that grows, each phenomenon that we that accompanies us, accompanies us on our journey through life, the sky, the mountains, spirits of nature, I can imagine why man would wish to wish to endow them with an inner inner something, an inner animus um, that they would call the god of that thing. I can see that. It, it's a beautiful and charming way of looking at it. And I can understand the Greek idea that there are these, you know, these principles of, of um, lightning or, or of war or of uh, wisdom and that, that to embody them, to personify them into Athena or Ares or whichever god you want makes enormous sense. But to say that there is one only god who made it all and who is, you know, that is just, what, why, who said, where, come on. And I love how, I love how when people watch, I don't know, with David Attenborough or the Discovery Planet um, type thing, you know, where you see the absolute phenomenal majesty and complexity and bewildering beauty of nature and you stare at it and, and then and you, somebody next to you goes, and how can you say there's no God? Look at that. And then five minutes later, you're looking at the life cycle of a parasitic worm whose job is to bury itself in the eyeball of a little lamb and eat the, eat the eyeball from inside while the lamb dies in horrible agony. And then you turn to them and say, yeah, where is your God now? You know, I mean, you, got, you, can't, you can't just say there's a God because the world is beautiful. You have to account for bone cancer in children. You have to account for the fact that almost all animals in the wild live under stress with not enough to eat and will die violent and bloody deaths. There is, not, there is not any way that you can just choose the nice bits and say that means there is a God and ignore the true fact of what nature is. The wonder of nature is, must be taken in its totality and it is a wonderful thing. It is absolutely marvellous and the idea that an atheist or a humanist, if you want to put it that way, doesn't marvel and wonder at reality, at the way things are, is nonsensical. The point is we wonder all the way. We don't just stop and say, that which I cannot understand I will call God, which is what mankind has done historically. That's to say, God was absolutely everything a thousand or two thousand years ago because we understood almost nothing about the natural world. So it could all be God. And then as we understood more, God receded and receded and receded. So suddenly now he's barely anywhere. He's just in those things we don't understand, which are important. But uh, um, I think it just is such an insult to humanity. And the Greeks got it right. The Greeks understood perfectly that if there were divine beings, they are capricious, unkind, malicious mostly, temperamental, envious, and mostly deeply unpleasant. Because that, that you can say, well, yes, all right, if there's going to be God or gods, then you have to, con you have to admit that they're very, at the very least capricious. They're certainly not consistent. They're certainly not all loving. I mean, really, it's just not good enough, is it? You know, if we empower ourselves with responsibility over our actions, responsibility over our destinies, and responsibility for directing and maintaining and creating our own ethical and moral frameworks, which is the most important thing, really, isn't it? Because perhaps the greatest insult to humanism is this idea that mankind needs a god in order to have a moral framework. It's, I mean, there's, a, there's a very clear way of demonstrating logically how absurd that is, because the warrant for that logical framework, uh, for, for that moral framework that comes from God, is always tested against man's own morals. Um, it's a complicated argument, but I mean that's you know it's, it's the standard one, which is pretty uh, unanswerable. But the, the, the idea that uh, that we we don't know right from wrong, but we have to take it from words put down in a book two, three, four, five, six thousand years ago and dictated to rather hot-headed neurotic desert tribes um, is it's just insulting. I mean, it's just no. I mean, it, you know. If there were a God, he would want us to be better spirited than to take his word for everything, you know? wouldn't he? If he gave us free will, would he really want us to say, no, I have to abide by everything that's written in this book? 
uh, all the laws of circumcision and of, and of eating and of um, and what to do with menstruating women, I'm going to obey those written down there. I won't think for myself because that's not required of me. Come on. It's just not good enough. And, and, and you know, I, I, I have no quarrel with individuals who are, who, wish, you know, who are devout and who have faith. I'm not, I don't want to mock them. I, I really don't. But damned if I'm going to be told by them what to do with my body or damned if I'm going to have the extraordinary battles won by enlightenment over, over the past 400 years um, to have that, those battles um, abnegated by, by a, a new dark ages. It's, it's, you know, it, the battle lines must be drawn. Music uh, in, in, in its time, but I mean, that's a, that's a function of history, you know. The fact is that the composers always write for power. Uh, because there or power and money, and it so happened that, that in the period when polyphony all the way through to the classical and, and, and early romantic era, the, all the power and the money was with the church. So some great masses and um, some some great choral music and some great oratorios were written um, from obviously the, 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 the Baroque age being the, the sort of pinnacle of that, but all the way through to 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 to, to the uh, Mozart's final works and his Requiem and and. Beethoven's Missa Solemnis and, you know, some, and, and um, Mendelssohn and so on. There have been some marvellous religious works and in painting similarly. But that's because the, these, these were princes. They were princes of the church. They were prince archbishops who, who employed Mozart. The, the, these, were, these were not spiritual beings who inculcated these composers with the d sense of the divine that makes the music divine. The glory of Verdi's Requiem or Mozart's Requiem or, or, or Bach's pieces is that they are fantastically, incredibly human. And like all great human things, they reach for the infinite. They reach for beauty. A religious person would call that the divine. You could call it the numinous, you could call it anything else, but uh, um, certainly uh, is that religion has been good for that and good for architecture because it has required an enormous, it required enormous buildings for the, uh, for the shepherding of people in, in order to, 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 to do the services, and they spend a lot of money on it. And, and so they're rather glorious buildings. You, you've got to hand them, hand them that. Um, did they make the trains run on time? No, they didn't do that. Um, that's about it, really. Uh, no, and there are some kind individual people, I mean, very kind people who, who give to the poor and look after the sick and so on. But it's not necessary and sufficient uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a justification for religion, because there are plenty of people who are not religious who are also kind to the sick and good to the poor and, and, and care about you know, people's well-being. Yes, oh, very much so. I mean, Trevor Huddleston and uh, uh, um, Archbishop um, uh, Tutu from, from South Africa are two good examples who, who, who uh, were both genuine men of their church, or uh, obviously Huddleston is dead, but uh, Tutu's still alive, and uh, who both fought a, a terrible injustice and used all the authority of their position amongst their believers, and, uh, and but very bravely spoke out, um, sometimes against the wishes of the church hierarchies. Some liberation the uh, the theologists uh, uh, who have, um, you know, some of them mad communists, some of them just decent liberals who fought against the uh, hideous doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, for example, and there are individual voices who, who are raised um, in conscience against uh, the, the bureaucracy and the dogma and the doctrine of the churches. And, you know, certainly, of course, individuals um, uh, in, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer, for example, in Germany, the Lutheran uh, minister who, 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 who spoke out against Hitler. Um, they're, they're, of course, they've been um, good and fine um, uh, religious people. And the Dalai Lama seems rather charming. I don't know. <laughs> I, it's terrible. I don't want to come over as some terrible anti-ecclesiastical figure, but...